Hi guys. Today we're going to talk about chapter 51, which is titled Sonography of the Second and Third Trimester. So basically what this chapter um, attempts to do is to give you an overview of all of the normal things um, that we look for in a second and third trimester scan. Now, in a normal pregnancy, if the pregnancy is going well, what they'll do is around 18 to 20 weeks, um, we do what is called this CPS or complete protocol scan. And um, that's when we go through the baby and we make sure everything looks well, good. Um, in this chapter, it kind of tries to explain this to you. Um, and it's kind of a long chapter because there's a lot of stuff that it goes through um, and it can feel overwhelming. Um, but I really highly suggest that you take your time reading this um, chapter and um, just going over the workbook and really understanding this because this is the foundation of what we are going to be learning for the next uh, 15, 14, 15 weeks. So the first thing I wanted to show you is this is just a generalized OB protocol. Everybody is going to have different protocols um, where you work. Uh, where I work, I work at a maternal fetal medicine place. So we're talk talking about this is all we do. So our protocols may be a little bit more detailed than some just uh, hospitals. Um, but wherever you are um, in clinicals, you'll fo follow their protocol. But this is just a sample that I want you to get familiar with. Um, so the first thing that you do when you are looking at um, starting your protocol is you want to look at the lower uterine segment. Um, and this will show you which way the baby is laying, the demonstration of the fetal lie. Um, so is the baby head up or head down, basically. Then you'll look at the placenta. You'll look at where the cord goes into the placenta, the amniotic fluid index, and then you'll measure baby, which we'll talk about more in the next chapter. Um, you will do the fetal biometry. So you'll measure, do different measurements. You'll do a side to side head measurement, which is the biparietal diameter, a head circumference, which is measuring the whole head around an abdominal circumference, a femur length and a humerus length. So that is about what you're gonna learn about in your lab. Um, then if we're lucky, we're gonna work on some of this other, these other structures. So the cranium, um, there's multiple things that we look at and I'll go over this in the PowerPoint. So this is just showing what we like to measure, the lateral ventricle, the cerebellum, the cisterna magna, and the thalamus and the cavum septum. Then you'll go to the face, you'll wanna do a frontal view of the face to look at the orbits, a profile to demonstrate the nasal bone and the nose and lips to make sure there's not a cleft. Then you'll um, go to the spine, you'll look through the spine, make sure there's no openings or spina bifida. Um, and then you'll look at the thorax. You'll make sure that the heart is facing the correct way. You'll look um, and that it's on the same side as the stomach. Um, you'll look for a fetal four chamber heart, the right ventricle outflow tract, the left ventricle outflow tract. You'll look at the echogenicity of the lungs and you'll look at the diaphragm showing the heart and stomach. Um, then you'll continue down on the baby and look at the stomach, the cord insert, the three vessel cord, the bladder, and the kidneys. You'll look at genitalia, which is what these, uh, most of these patients think that this is the reason that they're there, which they are to find out the gender, but they don't understand everything else that is going into this, which is making sure their baby is okay. Um, you'll look at the upper and lower limbs and the lower extremities, the feet, and then um, you'll evaluate the right and left adnexa of the uterus to just make sure that there's no large corpus luteal cyst or a dermoid or something that is um, could cause some issues. So that's just a, um, a little protocol that we try to put together. Um, and I put this on your canvas, so you can go ahead and look at this. Um, and kind of get familiar with it. All right, thanks.
Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, our PowerPoint. And when I downloaded this PowerPoint from um, the book site to kind of get a generalized view of like what they all wanted me to um, cover, which I kind of tweak it, there was 250 slides. And I was like, uh, no, that's pretty much just the whole book. So I am not going to go through 250 slides on Zoom. It's not fair <laughs> to anybody. So I wanted to just, I, I, broke it down to 140. And um, I wanted to go over the most important things that I feel like you really need to know. You can you can go down a rabbit hole um, and get stuck and not really um, just get the generalist, generalized things as a young sonographer that you just really need to know when you're scanning a baby. So I've tried to um, kind of highlight that stuff for you in this chapter. So what I just, I had showed you our protocol and basically the same thing. This is just kind of going over another second, third trimester protocol, what we do. Um, and I'm not gonna repeat myself on this, but um, again, get familiar with that. Now equipment, most of the time by 18, 20 weeks, we use a transabdominal probe um, and we scan on the belly unless we need to look at the cervix. And then in that case, we can use the transvaginal probe. Now, what I really want you to know, and this is the first thing that we're going to work on when we get um, patients into the OB lab is fetal presentation. And fetal presentation is basically how the baby is laying in there. And this is so important because once you can visualize how the baby is laying, you can, um, it's easier for you to scan because in your mind eye, you kind of know where to go to get a certain thing. So that's the first thing that we're gonna work on. Most babies are either, um, line longitudinal breach or vertex transverse or oblique um so this is um, mom's belly and then this is how they would be laying so they're either laying straight up and down with the head up or the head down they're either they can lay transverse or they can kind of lay in there sideways it kind of depends as long as they get when they're getting older like 34 weeks they tend to mostly be head down and that's eventually what you want if you want to have a vaginal birth is the baby to be head in a head down position which is referred to as a vertex or cephalic position so if the fetus is lying perpendicular to the long axis of the mother it's described as a transverse fetal lie um, when the fetus is um, lying in transverse the sonographer typically reports the position of the head maternal right or left in the position of the spine. Usually what I do when um, the baby's laying transverse, I'll say transverse lie, head maternal left. That way the doctor who's reading these kind of can um, visualize how the baby's laying in there. Here's some pictures of that. So the head is down towards the vagina, towards the cervix. So this would be a vertex baby laying on its right side. This baby is head up, booties down towards the vagina. So this is going to be a breech presentation. But they're both laying in long axis, axis if you know what I mean. Yep. Yeah. Um, so this, this is a transverse position. So this is a transverse position with the head towards um, the maternal left. And this is a transverse position with the head towards the maternal right. When the fetal lie is oblique, it generally described by stating which quadrant of the uterus contains the fetal head and direction and the fetal spine. Now, usually I don't go this far. I usually say, unless they are just in a wacky position, they usually move. Um, and I'll say fetal lie is variable if they're moving around during the exam. Most of the time I um, tend to stick to um, my words as vertex, breach, or transverse. So they can, the fetus can lie on the right side in either um, a vertex or a breach position. If you see here, they're both, um, the baby is lying on its right side in both, just with the head up or head down or they can do this the same way transversely, lay on their right side. 
So they can just lay in there all over, but it's important to figure out how is baby laying in there because then that determines where all the anatomy is. Same thing with the left side. So that is going to be your first thing that you're going to do. So this is a sagittal view of the uterus. So the head is up towards the mom's head. So this baby would be breech. Now they can be so cute. Look how cute. I love this little Frank breech position with their little heads up, their feet up towards their head. Aren't they so cute? But yeah, they can look, um, they can be breech different positions of breech. So they can be complete breech where their booty is straight down and their feet are up cross-legged. They can be incomplete breech or foot lane breech where the foot is down, kicking the bladder, or they can be frank breech where their little feet are up towards the head. This is a complete breech. This is the little booty up in the air here, down towards mom's um, cervix. And then the legs are underneath here. So this would be a complete breech. So next up, after you figure out if the baby is head up or head down, the next thing you need to determine is situs. And the right and left sides of the fetus need to be conceptualized to ensure normal situs positioning of the fetal organs. Because believe it or not, you can have organs on the wrong side of the body. It doesn't happen very often, but you can have um, situs inversus. Um, you can have um, asplenia. There's different kinds of symptoms. Um, syndromes that we will talk about later on in the semester, um, that the stomach would be on the right side, heart could be on the left, you know, it could just be weird. So for you to make sure that everything is on the correct side, you need to determine the situs of the baby, which way is the baby laying, which way, how is the baby in there? And that kind of will help you um, determine if stomach is on the left side like it should, heart is on the left side, um, liver's on the right kind of thing. For example, if a fetus is in a vertex presentation with fetal spine towards maternal right side, now visualize that. I'll give you a second, close your eyes and visualize. How would that be? The right side of the fetus is down and the left side is up. This is very hard. And it takes a lot of practice. And I feel like this is one thing that everybody does struggle with until you just get it. And that takes time. And, um, but I will work with you with baby dolls and all sorts of things to kind of figure out, out this part of the scanning. If the sonographer initially verifies that the fetal stomach lies on the left side, Later in the examination, the fetal right and left may be determined in relationship to the stomach. Um, I use the stomach as a huge landmark because it's usually a big black hole. And if I know that it's on the correct side, the left side, then I use that as a landmark for determining if the heart's on the right side, is on the heart is on the correct side, the gallbladder is on the right side, the apex of the heart is facing towards the left. Um, the fetal aorta is on the left, the IVC is on the right. So I just use that stomach so much to make sure everything is in its right spot. Now I kind of, um, I found this on the internet because in your book, it really doesn't talk about fetal scanning planes as much as maybe it should. Um, and I think part of the reason why is because it's hard to just put into words. It's more one of those things that, um, you're gonna just have to um, scan and learn that way. But I did wanna show you, these are the different fetal scanning planes and this is how we really um, look at different things. So this is the abdomen here, this black hole right there, this is the stomach. And this is my, a great landmark for me. Now these are all the positions that the stomach can be in depending on how baby is laying in here. So this baby right here, the left side is up. The spine is on the maternal right. So this baby would be laying in their vertex. Now on this baby, 
the spine is on the op opposite side. So the spine is maternal left. The stomach is on is down on the left side. So this baby would also be vertex. And this is stuff that I will show you in lab, but I wanted to show you how we how we're scanning how the ultrasound waves are going through the baby to get these different images. Okay, so then your book goes through all the fetal anatomy, all the normal fetal anatomy. Um, and then the rest of the chapters are all the abnormal things that can go on. And so it's important that you know what is normal. So then you, when we continue on to um, the next chapters, you know what's abnormal. At the same time, do you need to be an expert on the brain, know every single thing for this chapter? Absolutely not. But you do need to know the things that we look at. And so that is what I tried to kind of get through. <laughs> so the cranial bones ossify by 12 weeks. That um, survey fetal had to check the contour or outline of the skull bones. So you want to make sure that the bone, the skull is intact because there are different masses and things that can happen um, that where the bones would not be intact. And we'll talk about that more in the chapters to come. So this is the cranium. This is the brain. One huge thing that we do look at is the um, falcs separating the line here that separates the right and left hemispheres of the brain. We want to see that. We also, the thalamus, which is in the middle here, and I, I think it kind of looks more like a heart to me when we're scanning. Um, it's a very important landmark for us. We want to see that. We want to see the cavum septum pellucidum, which is the, like this little box looking thing. That's an important um, landmark for us also to see. In the back of the brain, we want to see the cerebellum, which is this part of the brain stem here. We want to measure that. Um, we will measure the cisterna magna. And we will look at the lateral ventricles. Now there's all this other stuff that happens in the brain. It's a beautiful, crazy organ, but you do not need to know all that for this class right now. No, you don't. What I highlighted is what I want you to know and to be able to identify on an ultrasound. And that's the cerebellum, the choroid plexus, the cisterna magna, the lateral cerebral ventricles, the midline fax, and the cave and septum pellucida. Those are the things that we look at routinely in our scans. So this is what we're gonna, what I'm gonna show you. So this little back of the brain, so this is in the posterior area of the back of the brain. This peanut looking thing right here is a cerebellum. This is a very important part of the brain that we need to make sure that is intact because multiple things can happen to the cerebellum that can cause issues. So we need to make sure that it looks nice and intact and it looks kind of like a peanut and it's measuring about where it needs to be. So we will measure from the top to the bottom of the cerebellum. Then we will measure this black area, which is fluid. This is the cisterna magna, this black area back here. And we want it less than 10 millimeters. And you need to know that. Everything in the brain is less than 10 millimeters. So the cisterna magna should be less than 10 millimeters. This heart looking thing right here, this is the thalamus. And the line separating it in the middle is the falx. Here's another picture of the thalamus. So we wanna see it look like this. So the pointy area is pointing towards the posterior area of the brain. And then it kind of opens up to the anterior portion of the brain. So the thalamus is your landmark. This is a beautiful picture of the, the line going through the brain, which is the falx. And then this little area right here, there's these three little lines. This is the cave and septum pellucida, and you wanna see that within the brain. You don't measure the thalamus or the CSP or the falx, but they are things that you want to get image of. At this thalamus and at this falx, at the CSP, this is a great, this is the landmarks that I want you to use to measure the head. So you'll measure and do your biparietal diameter and your head circumference at this image. Now we will talk about this more in chapter 52. Right now we're just looking at images. 
Your next thing that you're going to look at is the lateral ventricle. And we measure the lateral ventricle in the posterior horn from the top of it to the bottom. This echogenic area here, this is the choroid plexus. We want to visualize that. There is another one on top here. There, the one anterior is more difficult to see. But we want to look at both choroid plexus to make sure that there's no cysts within them. The lateral ventricle we want to measure, we want it less than 10 millimeters too. In transverse plane at most superior level within the skull, the contour of the skull should be round or oval. At this level, you should see the fissure, the midline falx, the falx cerebri observed as membrane separating the brain into two equal hemispheres. And the midline falx is an important landmark to visualize because its presence implies that the separation of the cerebrum has occurred. So that's really important. Here it is. You want to see that. The fetal ventricular system consists of two paired lateral ventricles, a midline third ventricle, fourth ventricle adjacent to the cerebellum. Usually the third and fourth ventricles um, you don't routinely look at um, when you're doing a complete scan because they're pretty small unless there is something going on. The ventricular system contains cerebral spinal fluid and um, which coats the brain and spinal cord. And the choroid plexus tissue, that echogenic area that I showed you um, within the lateral ventricle produces CSF. And the choroid plexus tissue located within the roofs of each ventricle except at the front, frontal ventricular horns. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. Here's the choroid plexus. This is the posterior horn of the ventricle. Why are they important to assess? you can have what is called ventricular megaly or hydrocephalus, which is a dilated ventricular system. Um, if the measurement's greater than 10, 10 millimeters, and that can mean that um, there could be a congenital anomaly going on, there could be a blockage somewhere in the ventricular system. And so it's important that we assess these. You want at less than one centimeter. The glomus or the body of the choroid plexus will fill the lateral ventricle in a normal pregnancy, just like you saw that the echogenic area was in that lateral ventricle. If it is floating or dangling within the cavity, it's called, um, it's a sign of um, a dilated ventricle. This again, we will go over in our central nervous system chapter, but um, this is an enlarged lateral ventricle. And you can see that the choroid plexus is not filling the whole ventricle. It's kind of dangling. It's a teardrop sign is what we say in ultrasound and can see how enlarged this lateral ventricle is. What in the world? There you go. Sorry about that. So the normal atrium um, of the lateral ventricle measures 6.5. If an atrium measures greater than 10, it warrants serial imaging and further evaluation. After you do that, and you're probably just feeling exhausted already, but we're only at the head, guys. <laughs> I promise it gets easier. Um, you'll um, go down towards the thalamus and you want to look at that in the cavum septum pellucidum. Between the thalami lies the uh, third ventricle. The cerebellum is located in the back of the cerebral pentacles within the posterior fossa and the cerebellar hemispheres joined together by cerebral firmus. The cisterna magna lies directly behind the cerebellum. Normal appearing cisterna magna may exclude almost all open spinal defects. Again, for another chapter. Um, cisterna magna almost always effaced or thinned out or obliterated. And fetuses with Arnold Kairi, I am horrible at that malformation changes associated with spina bifida, but again, we'll talk about that later. You want to see a normal cisterna magna. You want to see it at least two millimeters. You want to see it up to 10 millimeters. Past 10 millimeters, there could be something else going on. This is the cerebellum measurement, and then this is the cisterna magna. Oh, three to 11, yes. Five to six. Okay. I don't like this 11. We cut off at 10. 
just FYI. Okay, then um, the nuchal skin fold, which I have not gone over yet, we measure that and it's just this little area behind um, the cisterna magna, let me show you here. So this is um, part of the skull here. Um, and then from the skull to the back of the neck, that's called the nuchal fold. And we wanna measure that um, a thickened nuchal fold could be a sign of a Down syndrome or trisomy 21. So we like to measure that um, and it should be less than five millimeters. Okay, so then we go to the face and um, the visualization of the face um, is totally due to like the amount of amniotic fluid. If we have any acoustic windows um, it just is difficult to get a good face if um, you don't have much fluid. We do wanna look at the fetal orbits or the scary picture, which I'll show you <laughs> right here. Um, yeah, there is a thing that you wanna make sure that the orbits are directly, or they're in the correct position. Um, there could be conditions in which one of the eyes is missing, they're fused or closely spaced, hypotellurism, or they're really abnormally widened. Um, so that's why we take that image of that scary face right there. We don't usually do the um, orbital diameter, which this person is doing in this image, um, unless we are concerned that there could be abnormally spaced eyes. Most of the time, it's more of just looking at it and look, you can tell if it's normal or not. You want to get the cute facial profile, which is adorable. And I call this like the Facebook picture because this is the cute one that everybody loves um, and you want to but there's other things that we're looking for we're looking for making sure that the frontal bone is looking good that the baby has a nasal bone is a huge thing that the nose is nice and tipped that the lips are in the correct spot and then there's a very good chin there's a multiple different things that can go wrong in profiles when a baby has a congenital anomaly. So that's what we're looking for with that. And normally proportioned faces, segments containing forehead, eyes, nose, and mouth and chin, each approximately one third of the profile. Um, small nose or mid face hypoplasia where the um, nose and the mouth are pretty close together um, are components of Down syndrome and an absent nasal bone during the second trimester found in one fourth to one third of Down syndrome fetuses. The nasal bone is this little echogenic area right here, right by the nose. Um, once we do a coronal face view, the next thing I like to look at is, so I'll do a profile of the face, I'll look at that cute little front face view, make sure it looks good, the orbits look good. And then a very important view is looking at, at the tip of the nose and the upper lip. And the reason we do this is to make rule out cleft. You do wanna see, you will see the fetal tongue. A large tongue that is protrudes out could be um, associated with different aneuploidies or Beckwith-Weidman syndrome, it's called macroglossia. Um, it doesn't happen very often. I look at these cute fetal lips. So this is the tip of the nose, little nostrils and the upper lip and seeing that intact is just so great. Yes, you can also see hair. That's something that I like to show the patients if they, um, if I can get a good look, the little white spike is coming off the cranium, this hair. Then you can go and look at the spine. And our obstetric examination guidelines require that the sonographer looks at the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral spines to better exclude major spinal malformations, meningeomyelocils, which is spina bifida, and things that we'll talk about in our central nervous system chapter. So we'll do a long spine and a transverse spine. 
that looks like a railroad sign. So this, this is the spine. This is more of a coronal view, to be honest. But you can see where it comes to the neck. This is the cervical spine. Then in the middle of the chest is the trans or thoracic spine, lumbar spine, and the sacral spine. This is a long view of the spine. It kind of looks like railroad sign. The, and these are the vertebral columns. And then um, this is the sacrum that, and you want to see this taper down here and there not be an opening. I always like to visualize that part. Then I'll do, once I do sagittal pictures of the spine, then I'll do transverse pictures of it. And I'll take a transverse cervical, transverse thoracic, transverse lumbar and transverse sacral spine. And I'll make sure that all of this looks closed. And this is just what the spine looks like transversely. There's another picture of it closed. You'll see the three ossification sites, one, two, three, and, but you wanna see them closed almost in a circle. Here it is again, closed, nice and closed. So that's what the spine looks like transversely. Th these elements should be identified in normal fetus. These pedicles appeared splayed in a VCU shaped configuration in fetus and it's probably because of a spinal defect. All right, so then we get done with the spine, then we'll go to the thorax. We want to see those beautiful lungs that are echogenic and our lateral borders to the heart. And we will be looking at fetal breathing movements in lab. Um, we like to look at that, especially, and we should see that in the third trimester, especially. The lungs are so important part, which we'll talk about like, um, the baby can't survive without the lung development. So it's just really important that we assess the lungs for a lung mass. Again, in the thorax chapter, we'll talk about all the things that could go wrong with lungs. By the end of this semester, you will be like, how did I make it out a lot? <laughs> you know, I mean, it just is crazy like that we're all so normal, but then all this stuff can go wrong too. 99% um, of the babies are totally normal. So 1% are have the congenital anomalies. Fluid-filled fetal lungs observed as solid homogeneous masses of tissue bordered medially by the heart. And the heart occupies midline position within the chest. So this is a beautiful picture of the four chamber heart. One, two, three, four chambers of the heart. It's what we wanna see. And then next to it, these are the lungs. There's one lung and there's the other lung. You want to see them nice and homogeneous. Um, you'll also see the ribs, scapula, and clavicles too, and um, the rib cage. So these are little ribs in the chest. So the heart lies more transversely in the fetus than it is in the adult because the lungs aren't inflated. And um, the apex of the heart is directed toward the left anterior chest with the right ventricle is closest to the chest wall and the left atrium is closest to the spine. And you wanna see a four chamber view. So here is our four chamber view. This is the right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle, this intraventricular septum, the foramen ovale, the tricuspid valve, the mitral valve. You'll learn all this um, in our fetal heart chapters and the right ventricle is closest to the chest wall. This is just another view of the four chamber heart. So the four chamber view may be obtained by angling cephalid after obtaining a transverse view of the fetal abdomen. Um, and what we're looking for with the four chamber view, we wanna make sure that the situs and axis is correct, the apex of the heart should point Towards the left side, the presence of the right ventricle and left ventricle are there. Um, we need to evaluate the outflow tracks, um, take a heart rate, which is the normal rhythm is 120 to 160. The outflow tracks, that'll be a more advanced thing that you'll learn potentially in clinicals. But we wanna see the aorta and the pulmonary artery cross um, superior 
superior to the heart and that rules out a lot of the congenital heart defects. You wanna look for um, echogenic structures in the heart. There could be, um, which is pretty, nor I mean, one of the things that I see most of the time more than other congenital anomalies because it's really not an anomaly. It just is something that happens is an echogenic intracardiac focus. And it's just like a little echogenic area within the heart. Now one by itself usually is not a big deal. It usually goes away. Um, multiple, they will want to rescan the heart to make sure the flow of the heart looks good. Um, the reason that we do want to mention this is it's a soft marker for um, aneuploidy seeing these um, little echogenic fo focuses. We'll look at the diaphragm and the thoracic vessels. The diaphragm is the muscle that separates the thorax and abdomen. Um, it's commonly viewed in long plane. And I want to always make a, take a couple of images of the diaphragm to make sure that the abdominal contents are below the diaphragm and the heart and the lungs are above and we are looking at like a diaphragmatic hernia. This is, it's just like this faint little line here in the diaphragm. Fetal circulation, it's a huge thing. Um, I think we're gonna talk more about this in our heart chapter, um, but it's, I want you to kind of read about this in your um, chapter about how the circ, Regulation works from the baby to um, the mom. Oxygenated blood placenta flows through the umbilical vein within the umbilical cord to the fetal cord insertion where it enters the abdomen. And then the, from the umbilicus and the umbilical vein courses valid along the falciform ligament to the liver where it connects with the left portal vein. The left portal vein posterior to meet the right and anterior and right posterior portal veins, some blood goes to the liver, the ductus venosus sh shunts a lot of blood to the heart and brain. This is a flow chart for fetal circulation, which I feel like helps out a lot when I'm looking at it because there's multiple different pathways that blood takes in the heart. So the placenta is where it starts and then that oxygenated blood goes to the umbilical vein some goes to the liver, most is shunted through the ductus venosus into the inferior vena cava, and then through the heart. Some goes to the lungs, but not that many. Um, a lot of blood goes um, through the foramen ovale to left atrium, left ventricle, and the aorta, and then goes to systemic circulation to provide oxygenated blood throughout the um, body of the baby. So it's pretty amazing how it all works. Deoxygenated blood exits through the umbilical arteries, which arise from the fetal iliac arteries, and only 5 to 10% of the blood actually circulates to the lungs. After birth, the foramen ovale, the ductus venosus, and ductus arteriosus close when the baby starts breathing on its own. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, you will see the liver on a fetus. I, um, we look at the liver, but we don't like measure the liver or anything. Just make sure that there's no masses. It looks good. There it is. The fetal liver is the main storage site for glucose and very sensitive and disturbances in growth. So, um, if a baby is not growing correctly, the abdomen seems to get smaller the fastest. You might see the fetal gallbladder. Sometimes it's distended. Sometimes it's not, it just kind of depends on the baby. So this is the stomach, that black hole is the stomach. I wanna see that. This is the liver here. And then this is the little gallbladder. Kind of looks just like a baby gallbladder. Um, the stomach is a huge landmark that you want to see um, and usually can start seeing around 11th week and full stomach should be seen in all fetuses beyond 16 weeks of gestation. This black hole is a stomach. You also want to definitely look at both kidneys 
and a bladder. Um, the kidneys are located on either side of the spine in the posterior abdomen. They're kind of difficult to see at first. It sometimes takes students a little bit of time. This is a sagittal image of the kidneys. Kind of looks like what you guys have been scanning, probably. And this transversely, these are both kidneys here in like a transverse kidney view, just like if you were transversely scanning your classmate's kidney. So you wanna document both those and you definitely wanna document the bladder. A bladder is another one of those easy landmarks for you to see. Now, if you cannot identify the urinary bladder in the presence of oligohydramnios, which is low fluid, less than five centimeters of fluid within the gestational sac, there could be a suspect for a renal abnormality or premature rupture of membranes. So that's why it's important for you to look at the bladder, which is another, should be another big black hole here. You'll also image that two umbilical arteries coming across the bladder here, and that will show a three vessel cord. And then we'll go down and we'll look at the genitalia um, to identify male and female. Now you would think this would be easy, but it really is kind of difficult unless the baby is just like spread open, legs are spread open. Um, it just gets, is very sometimes dif more difficult than you would think. So the female genitalia um, is usually seen in transverse image and it kind of looks, we call it like the hamburger sign but you can see the little labia and this is a little bottom and it looks like a little labia there. So that would be a female. We wanna make sure that we are, it seems like 16 to 20 weeks of um, gestation. Sometimes the labia can be a little swollen and so it could look like a small penis and scrotum. And so that's why you just wanna be very, very, very cautious that you don't confuse a normal labia with a scrotum. So this is the labia, this is girl, girl, the thigh. And the scrotum and penis are fairly easy to recognize in either scanning plane, especially if the baby is just like wide open there. It's, I mean, even a person that is not, doesn't do this for a living could probably figure out that that's a boy. Um, <laughs> this is a little turtle sign is what we call the scrotum and the penis. Then we want to look at the upper and lower legs. These are just images of the extremities. We will want to take upper thigh pictures and lower leg pictures, rule out club foot. Um, then we will want to um, take feet pictures. Look at that cute foot picture. Oh my goodness. Um, then we'll take upper arm images and lower arm images with the hands. I love to get an open hand if I can. So seeing the five fingers is just really rolls out a lot of stuff and just um, a good image to get. Short femurs or short humerus, humeruses could be associated with anemploidy. You also want to look for bones and um, for evidence of bowing, fractures, demineralization, because um, this could be a cause of skeletal dysplasia. So we measure the thigh bone and we measure the humerus. When we're looking at lower legs, I like to look at both the tib, tib, tibia and the fibula. I like to see the feet facing forward. This helps me roll out club, club feet. I like to see the open hand of the baby that rolls out trisomy 18. Usually trisomy 18 babies are have clenched hands. And I like to see the ulnar and radius in both of the lower arms. And then get feet pictures. And if you can get those awesome digits and count those toesies out, then it's, all, it's great. It doesn't always happen, but give it your best shot. So the femur is the most widely measured long bone and can be found by moving transducer along the fetal body to the fetal bladder. At this junction, the iliac leans are noted, and by moving the transducer inferior to the iliac crest, the femoral echo comes into view. And it's just a nice bright white bone, the fetal shaft, and you'll measure it from 
the length of it, not including this point right here, which is the diaphysis. You should just count out those toes. After the fetus is studied, um, evaluate the placenta amniotic fluid in the pelvis. Um, I want to look at the umbilical cord inside going into the placenta and then number of vessels in the umbilical cord. A normal human umbilical cord contains one umbilical vein and two umbilical arteries. So it looks like a Mickey Mouse, one big vein and two little arteries. You'll see the cord going into the baby here. That's where the belly button will be. And the two arteries coming across the bladder. This is showing a three vessel cord. You'll look at the cord insert going into baby here. And this is kind of just talks about the umbilical cord a little bit more, which we'll talk about later on. This is the umbilical cord going into the placenta. I like to get this image too. So the major role of the placenta is to permit exchange of oxygenated maternal blood and deoxygenated fetal blood. The maternal vessels coursing posterior to the placenta circulate blood into the placenta and blood from fetus reaches this point through the umbilical cord. So the placenta could um, originate close to the fundus along the anterior wall or the posterior wall. Um, it just kind of depends. Um, and we'll talk about this more in another chapter coming up, I chapter 53. I don't know. There's one chapter we talk about the placenta. So we'll we'll really get into it more. Um, but you either can have an anterior placenta, a posterior placenta. Um, as long, it doesn't matter which way, that's either one's fine, as long as it's not close to the cervix and not a placenta previa or a low lying placenta. So the placenta assumes relatively homogeneous pebble gray appearance during the first part of the pregnancy and is easily recognized with its characteristic smooth borders. Really easy to see. Here it is, this hypochoic mass on top of the baby. And the amniotic fluid, you will start measuring four quadrants of amniotic fluid within, um, after 24 weeks. Before that, you will measure one big pocket of fluid in the gestational sac for the baby. And the amniotic fluid allows the fetus to move freely within the amniotic cavity, maintains intrauterine pressure, protects developing fetus from injury, umbilical cord and membranes, lung, skin, and kidneys all contribute to the protection of amniotic fluid. The quantity of the fluid is directly related to the kidney function. So fetus lacking kidneys or malformed kidneys produce little to no amniotic fluid. Um, and those babies have a very poor prognosis. The amount of amniotic fluid regulated not only by production of amniotic fluid, but also by removal of fluid and swallowing. So everybody, the baby and the placenta, they have to work together to keep a certain amount of fluid within the gestational sac. Normal lung development is critical, dependent on the exchange of the amniotic fluid with the lungs. So the baby swallows the fluid, the baby breathes the fluid in, the baby urinates the fluid. The fluid is like the life source of that baby and um, is very sterile. But all of the organs develop, work together to um, help produce amniotic fluid. Um, but the lungs are so important that the amniotic fluid helps develop the lungs. And so when a baby has something going on that there's a ruptured membranes or all of, like the mom's water broke early or the baby doesn't have kidneys so the baby can't produce fluid, then the lungs suffer. And when the baby comes out, if the lungs aren't developed the baby can't survive. And so it's very important um, that we assess the amniotic fluid. The volume of the amniotic fluid increases to 34th week, and then it kind of slowly diminishes. During the second early third trimester of pregnancy, amniotic fluid appears to surround fetus and should be readily apparent. 
So all the black is the amniotic fluid. From 20 to 30 weeks of gestation, the amniotic fluid may appear somewhat generous, although typically represents normal amniotic fluid. So it'll look like they have a lot in there, but that usually is normal. Um, you want a good amount. Um, most of the time we just do a subjective observation of the fluid. Um, if I feel like, wow, this baby looks like it has a lot of fluid, then I'll measure it. And at 20 weeks, when we do the complete scan, most of the time it's just a subjective, subjective thing. Like, yeah, it looks like there's enough. Um, after 24 weeks, that's when I start measuring the fluid no matter what, and I'll use do four quadrants of fluid. So I'll separate the uterus into four quadrants and I'll take an amniotic fluid index which is, and I'll go to each quadrant and I'll measure the fluid in each quadrant. And then it adds it up. This is normal AFI is between five to 24, less than five centimeters is considered oligohydramnios and greater than 24 centimeters is considered polyhydramnios. Uh, the uterine cervix, we also like to visualize. Um, we just take an image of it um, but I don't ever measure the cervix transabdominally. If for some reason we need to measure the cervix, I'll do a transvaginal ultrasound. When the cervix appears shortened during the abdominal scan, or when the patient is at risk for incompetent cervix or premature delivery, um, a transvaginal transperineal imaging of the cervix is added. So um, we'll just do a transvaginal ultrasound to look just straight at the cervix. Most um, normal cervixes are about three centimeters. Um, if a cervix is shortened or if the internal os appears to have a V or U shaped, it is important to be monitored and treated. Again, I think we will talk about this later on in a different chapter, but um, this is the bladder and then this is the cervix, the baby there. And that's a transdomal view. Okay, well, I think we made it through for today. Um, if you have any questions, just give me a call. And again, don't get too overwhelmed <laughs> because I know it's just a lot of information, but we will break it down. So it'll be all right. All right, have a good week. Bye-bye.